Tom, are you okay? I lost her. Her? She was going to be this epic, trilogy-worthy character. I was going to be the hottest writer in Hollywood. But I can't get past Act 1. You need some writer's group therapy. Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers. Are you ready for your session? Doctors are in. So we were having a really interesting discussion in the wake of Stan Lee's passing. Talk about a legend, right? Yeah, seriously. And I know that towards the end of his life, there were a lot of issues as far as, um, because he created all those characters, and yet they were works for hire and not his own you right. Know, he like was he hired by him. Jack Kirby and their family and company mm-hmm. to create them. So there, there was a big lawsuit about the whole thing. You, you can read about that online. But it's, yeah, they were, the, the question was whether or not he, as the creator of the characters, whether he owned any of that property himself or if because he was hired to do it, they all belonged to the Kirby family. So that begs the question, when do you have creative control and what is a work for hire? Well, it doesn't mean he didn't have creative control, but you have a boss, basically, when someone hires you to do something. So if someone says, go out and create characters for your movie or for your TV show, you're acting on their instructions and you're getting paid by them. So um, that becomes work for hire, right? But as far as what it means to have complete creative control over your, your properties. So back in my songwriting days, all my albums were independent creations. And I signed off with the producer. He said, Hey, I'm your hired gun. I'm not going to try to claim any points on these albums. If you make it big, you know, they're completely yours. You own the songs a hundred percent. You own the recordings a hundred percent. And that was very important because a lot of times all these deals, when it comes to creative entities of any sort, people can take percentage points if, if you negotiate that. And so it does kind of count in the end. Yeah. Are you following kind of what I'm saying? Like who, where the, where the control originates? Sure. Yeah. And, and it makes a lot, it's very important for, you know, things down the line too. I mean, talk about residuals and, you know, derivative works and things. You need to have control of that because if you write a movie and someone else goes out, you, you sell it to someone else and then they, they buy all those rights in the negotiations, then if they make a billion dollars, you don't get anything out of it. Or if they change it and distort it, how you don't like it, you can't do anything to, you know, you know, what do you, what's the word I'm looking for? You, uh, you can't do anything to counter that, to rectify the situation. Yeah. I remember, um, <laughs> I, I love the book. I was not a fan of the movie, but if you've ever read Gail Carson Levine's Ella Enchanted, it's a, a children's book. Oh yeah, based on the Cinderella fairy tale retelling of it, and then of course it was a movie made later on with um, Anne Hathaway in it. Mm-hmm. And I remember I loved the book, and I was so excited for the movie. And I saw the movie, and I'm like, "What happened?" And I read an interview with the author, and she actually said when she sold the rights to the book, they basically said, "Hey, we're going to go to town with it." And she said, "Okay, the only thing is keep her obedient. Everything else got changed." It, it doesn't resemble the book at all. So that's another thing, too. When you sign off your rights, you know, versus J.K. Rowling, who had a ton of creative control over everything in that franchise for Harry Potter, they were like, whatever you want, J.K., you know, it's Harry Potter. You do your thing. So the books and the movies are very similar. Right. And um, she even wrote the screenplay for the latest um you know, uh, Fantastic Beats, uh, Crimes of Grindelwald. She actually wrote the screenplay for that. Mm-hmm. She Although, hadn't done before. Yeah, to be fair, Fantastic Beasts doesn't have, um, it's just a, it's a textbook. It doesn't really have a plot in the Harry Potter world. Right, so it's not really an adaptation kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, they kind of they kind of made it like a prequel, but um, but the point being, you know, she, she has kind of carte blanche though, because she made Warner Brothers a bill- billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're when you're going out to sell your script, you know, there's some things at the very or you know, at our level that we have to be concerned about. And that has to do with things like rewrites. Like you may uh be hired to write a script, um, and once you turn it in, 
uh, they may say thank you, goodbye, and you never get your hands on it again. They may hire someone else to rewrite it. They may change things that you don't like and make a movie, and your name might still be on it, but you don't have any control over that. Yeah. You know, or when you sell the rights to your story, if somebody wanted to make a story out of your life. And I remember, too, they're not as popular now, but when I was an independent musician, things like American Idol, that was really huge. And the voice was just kind of up and coming. And a lot of independent artists that I knew who were making a living as independent musicians did not want to get on those shows because apparently in the contracts, they said, if you sing an original song on our show, we'll own the rights to it. Or they could take what they wanted to you know, do with your branding as far as your image and stuff. So a lot of musician friends I knew read the contracts and were like, it might be great for my career, but I'm at a point where I'm losing too much if I sign off on this. So you also have to think about when you're signing away, not just your characters and your stories, but even maybe your branding. Mm-hmm. You know, but at the same time, sometimes it is good to be a hired gun, right? If you don't, maybe you're just getting started, you need to get your feet wet. You're, if you don't mind walking away from that property, you know, some things you can only use is maybe for your real, maybe even for demo purposes, but I think they might frown upon it if it's something that hasn't really been released in public yet. So you got to be careful about things like that. Yeah. I th- that goes into the whole just copywriting your own work stuff, which, you know, registering with the Writers Guild, copywriting, those are important things to do uh, before you you share your properties with anybody. And you do have control over that, too. No, but I mean, but I mean, if you're if you're working for a company and you mm-hmm. create a character, you can say, oh, I created that character, but you might not be able to, like, take it somewhere else. Is what oh, I'm saying. sure. Yeah. Because you were, it belongs to the company, not yeah. to you. Well, in, in TV writing uh, in the, and in the Writers Guild contract, there is actually um, fees involved in creating characters. So if you create a character uh, for a TV show that then appears in future episodes, you actually get payments for that. Part of you know the, the creating the creation part, the storytelling part. So whereas the, the person who created the show is the creator of the show, you can actually be a creator on a show that you did not create because you created characters and that creates stories. So that's kind of a different way that you can have some control in the writing process. Yeah. You see that all the time or people who, yeah, create the show and then they walk away after a season. Yeah. It's like a well-oiled machine. (laughs) Yeah. The other side of the, the control question is whether you um, get paid to write something up front and then, you know, give it over to whoever, you know, wanted you to write it or whether um, you write your own things. And then when somebody wants to buy it from you, they can choose to either. Well, a lot of times in the low budget film world, I see a lot of these requests where they're like, well, we don't have any money. So we're just going to, um, you know, we'll give you a, uh, when we sell it, we'll pay you. Or when we, um, if we sell it, you'll get a percentage of the ticket sales or something like that. So there's this question of, uh, she, and actually I've talked to attorneys about this. And they usually just say, get as much money up front as you can, because you never know if they're going to actually make the film and then how well it's going to do. Mm-hmm. That deferred payment thing is actually common in acting, too. There's a, yeah. they, they, uh, a lot of films will be like, oh, you know, it's the SAG ULB day rate, but deferred. Or another thing that I've seen commonly is, oh, we're going to put it on Amazon and everyone gets percentage points. Some places even say, hey, actors, you pay a little bit towards the movie, you get a producer credit and you get a role. So you're kind of paying for your role as well. That's interesting. Yeah. That's been around for a while. Yeah. With, with your own scripts though, you know, you could spend years developing a script and then to give it to someone and have them say, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to give you any money. I'll give you a tiny little bit of money for the option agreement. And in two or three years, I might make the film. That's, that's, you know, it seems extremely uh, unbalanced for the amount of work you do in, you put into it, because um, it's not just a script you're handing over to them. It's, you know, could be literally years of work you put into that. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, if you are working with an established studio or producer and you know that they have financing and backing and they're going to make the movie and make it well and have great actors in it and you're like really confident that you're going to see something on the back end. Maybe that's something to con- you know consider at that point. But 
in general, most of the major studios, you know, the Writers Guild signatories, they're going to, you know, go with the, an upfront contract and purchase price. Well, you do have to be careful because there's also those horror stories where they option your script just because they had a similar idea. And so they're going to shelve yours and keep right. it out of the running. Yeah. So you do have to be careful. And that happens in music too. I know several people who were signed to labels, they cut an album on that label and then for whatever reason got dropped and could not release that album. They, they lost their songs. So right. it happens. And that's the reason for like submission agreements. I actually just sent off one of my scripts today and I had to fill out a little agreement that says, I understand you might have something similar to this and I can't sue you if you happen to make a movie that's you know, similar. Yeah. Of course, you know, that can always be challenged depending on how much, you know, if they literally copy things verbatim, you can usually go after them, but still it takes lawyers and money to do that. As my lawyer always uh, advised me, always try to get the money up front because <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Companies buy scripts and they go bankrupt and then the scripts either get sold to someone else or get stuck in court for years and years. So, you know, just protect yourself. And make sure, you know, if you're going into a writer's agreement of any kind, whether it's, you know, to write your own stuff or to be hired to write something as a work for hire, that you understand where you where your rights end and your employers begin. Yeah. So how about for all of you? If, have you had an experience like this? Let us know at WG Therapy. You can also find us online at writersgrouptherapy.com. And if you like what you hear, subscribe and share it with your friends. We'll see you next week.